Bar. And for my senior year project, I researched the relationship between children and nature. And then I made this website, naturebug.org, sort of relating to everything I researched and what I found. Now, before we get started, we can get the lights. I feel like since it's still bright and early this Thursday morning, we should do a little warm up to get us all awake. So how many of you guys know what kind of animal this is? Come on, you guys are teachers. <laughs> and I'll expose myself, I'm a biology teacher too. Is that a molecule? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a molecule, but it does start with an M. Any guesses? Yes. It is a mouse. Very good. Next one. You guys are brilliant. How about this? It's a little harder. Perfect. And this? Nope. Nope. Yes, it is a wiggly tuff. However, the rest of you didn't know that. There's no need to be ashamed. It's actually the response I was hoping for, but Jack here is aware of her culture. Um, and the reason I was hoping you guys wouldn't know it, because it gives a little perspective on this next statistic I'm going to tell you guys, which is that according to the British study published in Science Magazine in 2002, the average eight-year-old can identify 80% of the 100 most common Pokemon, but only just under half of the 100 most common native species that live in their area. And for the record, I saw the list of the native species that they use. They were animals like deer, squirrel, flowers like dandelion. They really weren't difficult. I think the, the hardest one on there was maybe badger. And the, these kids only knew about half of it. And I don't know about you guys, but that bothers me. It actually really bothers me that an eight-year-old is more likely to know that this thing, this random cartoon, is a squirtle than to know that that, that real-life animal that probably lives a mile away from their home is a turtle. And luckily, however, I'm not completely self-absorbed, absorbed, and I know that just because something bothers me doesn't mean that it's necessarily important. For example, slow hallway walkers bother me, but no one's going to make a website on that because that's not important. But when I started a senior year project, I realized that in order to prove that this had any purpose at all, I needed to show in my research that I'm not just gathering random info that bothers me, like all these statistics, but that it actually has some sort of significance, that it's important that we know about this. And that was sort of my main goal when I came up with these original three questions, because at the beginning I wasn't really sure where my research would take me, so I came up with three really broad and general questions. They were figuring out whether there is, a, is actually a relationship between children and nature, and if that exists, whether it's actually important, whether kids actually need this physical relationship with nature, and if even that turned out to be true, then how we can get today's kids, who are so much more absorbed in technology and our modern lifestyles, to actually go outside and experience nature the way they're supposed to. Now, starting from the beginning, Mr. Kenosi, at the beginning of her class, told us that when we were researching, we were going to find the book, that sort of one book that was her holy grail and had all the info we needed, and he was right, as usual. And for most of my research, that book was Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. And once I really sucked all the juice out of that, I moved on to In Defense of Childhood and a bunch of other resources, such as a survey I created in February. I was expecting about 200 responses, but I really lucked out, and almost 500 people took the survey. And it was really amazing, actually. But moving on to the actual research, for my paper, I divided it into four main sections, changes, effects, causes, and solutions. But since we don't have that much time, I'm going to speed through a couple of them. For example, changes. Because since you guys are all either educators or students, you're aware of the fact that, oh, you can't really see the text, but you probably noticed in your past years of teaching that for students, the use of electronics has gone way up, and the time they spend in nature has gone way down. Um, there are a bunch of statistics and numbers, but I'm not going to get into that, because I'm sure you've all noticed it. Uh, the effects, on the other hand, are the more important part. I'm going to start off with the physical. Um, in some controlled experiments done in Sweden, they've suggested that kids who play in natural areas actually develop significantly better agility, balance, and motor control than those who play on regular playgrounds or especially indoors. 
Now, this might seem kind of weird, because how could nature do that? Shouldn't it just be physical activity in general? That's what I was asking myself while I was researching. But as it turns out, it actually is something to do with nature, because the past two decades have been the largest increase in organized children's sports and physical education ever. Yet still, we're in an obesity crisis. 40% of boys, 70% of girls can't do a single pull-up. 66% can't pass their physical. Now, a couple decades ago, this wasn't the case. But still, organized sports have been increasing, and nature has been decreasing, and this is what we get. So obviously, there's other factors playing into it, but I think this kind of suggests that nature does play an important role in this. Um, on to the mental benefits. You've probably all heard of the fact that nature reduces stress. That's been in the news a lot. But also, recent studies are now even suggesting that it increases resistance to depression, and it reduces the symptoms and possibly even the development of ADHD. And I've seen this firsthand with some of the kids that I work with who have ADHD. And when they go outside, they are so much better behaved that it's, it's really impressive. I don't know if you guys have noticed it. And <clears throat> sorry. This last point on here is also pretty interesting. It's just a preliminary study, but they're finding that actually kids who play more in nature have larger, more fully developed brains than kids who don't. Since it's a correlational study, the causation isn't exactly established. But um, if the causation is that nature is causing more fully developed brains, their theory is that it's because of the multi-sensory stimulation, because when you're outside in nature, you're seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, you're touching, you're exposed to everything, versus when you're just inside watching TV, you see it, you hear it, that's it. And so that's one of the theories that they have. Um, <clears throat> as far as the social benefits of nature, um, there aren't that many studies on it, but I think from our own memories and experiences, we can tell that when we're outside in nature with our friends and we've put all our electronics away, we're more likely to interact and play together and be more creative than we are like these two kids inside with their phones out texting each other. That's just one of my observations. Now for the causes. In Richard Liu's book, he actually kind of goes into blaming all sorts of people and organizations and politics and stuff. And I don't want to get into that because I don't think that there's any one real cause or person to blame because of this. There's a lot of factors that go into it. I'm going to show a few of them. Electronics, it's kind of obvious. In my survey, 81% of people said that the main reason that they don't go outside in nature more is that they don't have time. Yet 54% of those same people said that they spend over three hours on the internet. 36% said they spend more than two hours watching TV. And 27% said they spend over two hours playing video games. So it's really not a lack of time. It's just how you use your time. And electronics really takes up more time than nature. And in one of the books, I remember there was a quote that TV takes up time, whereas nature amplifies it. Like when you're out there, they seem longer because you're doing stuff that are really, you're involved in it. Um, <clears throat> another one is parents, which it's an interesting one because obviously parents just want to protect their kids. They, they always mean well, but sometimes when it's taken to the extreme, it can actually hurt the kid more than help them. Like when you're telling your kids, oh, don't climb that tree, you're going to fall off. Well, yeah, but if you don't climb the tree, you're going to have all these other awful effects too. And also, like some parents don't let their kids outside at all with, unless they're supervised by an adult. Like, how are they going to learn anything? And then the worst example, I think, is putting your kid on a leash. I just, I don't know what's going on there. Um, and another paradoxical one is environmental protection, which I hadn't thought of before I did all this research, because it seems so obvious that environmental protection is good for kids. It's teaching them to protect the environment. It's necessary. They're great role models. But when you think about it, with all these signs forbidding everything, like you can't climb the trees, you can't build tree houses, it's a fire hazard. Kites are banned because they scare the birds away. And <clears throat> sorry, they close the beaches for nesting animals and so on and so forth. And all of those things are really important. But on the other hand, where are the kids going to go? Like, how are we supposed to encourage them to go out more in nature if we're closing everything down? Which leads me 
to the next point, solutions. So we need to find a way to sort of balance protecting nature as well as allowing kids to actually be in nature in order that in the future they will also want to protect it. So um, there's really three main goals, I think, in order to finding a solution. The first one is what I'm doing right now, informing people, getting the word out that nature is actually important. We do, in fact, need it. The second one is kind of interesting, that nature is local. In my survey, I forget the percentage, I think it was like 52% said that they don't go into nature because it's too far away. Well, it's not, it's in our backyard. There's Cabot Woods, there's Cold Spring Park, it's everywhere. But there's this idea, this misconception that nature is the Amazon rainforest, nature is Yellowstone. It's all these far away places that we can't get to. We need to change that misconception to help people realize that nature is right around us, it's right here. We don't need to travel 100 miles to get to it. And the last one is getting people excited. Nature is fun, it shouldn't be a chore, it shouldn't be homework, it should be something you wanna do. Which leads me right into my field work, which is making my website, naturebug.org. And rather than talking about it, I'm actually gonna show you it. First, here's my bibliography, because I'm gonna X out of this. Here it is, naturebug.org. Took me about a month or so to make it. The pictures are kind of dark, I'm sorry about that, but it's what we got. Um, as far as my goals for the solution, I put a bunch of info on here that I just talked about with you guys. I also put up the statistics from my survey. They're all, well, most of them are up here. Some of them are interesting, like the relation between how stressed adults were in childhood and how physical they were in childhood, whereas today how stressed kids are and then, well, the, the graph isn't up yet, but it would be the opposite for, opposite for kids today. Um, so these are all the statistics sorry, for, for my survey. And I think the more important part is actually, come on, the activities page where I tried to collect and make all sorts of unique, creative crafts or activities that kids could do to inspire them to sort of go outside. And they're pretty easy, most of them. Like this one, it's a flower sculpture made completely out of seashells. I think it looks pretty good and sophisticated, but it's actually really easy to make. You just get a bunch of seashells, glue them together in a shape of a flower. And I don't know, I like doing it, so I assumed other people might be inspired to do it. Um, there's some here that are more appropriate for younger kids, like a wildlife observatory. I used to do this a lot. You take some apple juice or beer also works. You mix it with brown sugar to make it really sweet, and you put it on a, a log or a rock or something, and a few hours later, all sorts of animals start, start, start showing up. Mostly they're squirrels and butterflies and moths and stuff like that, but if you wait until later in the evening, raccoons start to show up. I've seen skunk footprints next to it the morning later, so you can get some pretty cool observing done. Another one of my favorites, this is actually my absolute favorite. I brought it in, actually. It's a pine cone in a bottle. Little kids really love this because and I'm not going to scroll down on purpose so you don't know how it's made. It's a pine coal in a bottle and how the heck did that get in there? Yeah, little kids really, really love this to show their friends like, look, I put a pine cone in a bottle. I'm so cool. And I don't know. That's my favorite one. You guys can check that out later. Um, thanks for the lights. So not going to scroll down. You're going to have to check out the site to learn how to do it. And this is another one I want to talk about. I put a bunch of apps that you can download onto your iPhone or iPad or phone or whatever that are nature related because it might seem kind of paradoxical right now as my, the website on nature because it's online and you have to not be in nature to see it. But I, I actually thought about this a lot and I realized that if you put technology against nature in today's society, as sad as it is, technology is going to win. Kids are going to choose to be with their electronics rather than to go outside. So rather than doing that, I think it's better to encourage kids to use technology to enhance their experience in nature. So I put all these ideas for a bunch of cool apps that you can download onto your phone <clears throat> to sort of encourage people to go outside. And some of them are actually really cool, like the Star Walk. When I downloaded that, I remember I, I, I really didn't feel like going outside, but as I started checking it out, I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. I need to go outside right now and see how it works. 
So, yeah. Now, for the nature page. Originally, this wasn't in my outline or my plan of what I was going to put on my website, but it ended up coming to be because I was, as I was brainstorming ideas for what to put on the activities page, I kept coming up with things like, how to identify poison ivy, how to predict the weather. And I realized that those aren't activities. Like, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go identify poison ivy today. So I made this other page, which is sort of a bunch of resources that are useful when you're outside in nature. This is my favorite one, how to identify a bunch of dangerous plants. And oh, sorry. I really suggest that you guys check it out, because there is a lot of poison ivy here in Newton. I actually brought in a fresh sample right from Washington Street. It's right on the table over there. So it's really everywhere, and I suggest checking it out. Another useful one, and I think this is Mr. Kenosi's favorite, is a page of cool ways to start a fire. It's still under construction, but I think my favorite one is using a soda can and chocolate to start a fire. Basically what you do is you shine up the bottom of it with some chocolate because it's a mild abrasive and it polishes it up real nice. Um, it takes about an hour or so to get it shiny enough. I actually brought in the can. It's up there if you guys want to check it out later. And once you get it all shiny, you direct it towards the sunlight, and you put something flammable in the focal point of it. And depending on how strong the sun is, within a couple seconds or up to almost an hour, it'll ignite. And it's really cool. And I'm sorry, I don't have the video yet, but it will be up, hopefully, by the weekend. And I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. I would encourage some people to go outside. I remember during the informal presentation, Rocco was especially like, oh my god, I'm totally going to do that. <laughs> so, Me too, I'm just trying to, trying to hold it back. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think this last one that I'm going to show you guys is the mystery creature page. And the idea here is that once people actually start going to my site, it's only been up for four days, so it hasn't gotten a lot of hits yet. But once they do, when a lot of people have pictures of random things in nature, and they don't know what they are. And the idea is, is that they'd send them in, and I tried to figure it out for them. Like, these are all my pictures now, because obviously no one has come yet. But I was always wondering what those random lumps are on trees. So I got a picture of one, and I looked it up, and I put it up here. So maybe some people are also interested. And yeah, that's what I did for a month and a half. I hope that it encourages people to go outside more and be healthier and happier people. There you go. Where did you go to for all these pictures? Uh, and I, I assume since this is all about nature, you actually went out and personally took these pictures? Yes, these are all my pictures except one, which is my friend's. But, um, most of them are, I just had in my photo album from past excursions, like um, this one. Uh, you can't really see it, but that's OK. I'm also a, a Hungarian scout. So on the weekends, we go camping a lot and do all sorts of outdoor stuff. So I have a lot of opportunity to actually take pictures with a bunch of cute little kids who are outside in nature. So it works out. But during the project, I was mostly in my backyard doing stuff. What would you say to kids that are living in like Well, Central Park is nature. Definitely is. They have a pond. They've got a bunch of trees. The wildlife there is crazy. They've got like crazy raccoons over there. It's really kind of scary, actually. And I mean, you know, go five steps outside of Newton. I mean, not Newton of New York. There's there's nature there. All you need for nature is you know, things that aren't man-made, like grass, fields, trees, anything. Like even just if you have one tree in your neighborhood, go climb it, go build a tree house on it. Like there's a bunch of bugs living in it. Look, look at them. Like it's not, it's very local. There's nature everywhere. I can't really think of any place where you cannot get to nature at all. So just look for it and you'll find it. <coughs> You mentioned at the beginning a study from Sweden. Yeah. 
effects of, of nature. What, what did they define as kids playing in nature versus playing? It was a, a controlled experiment, actually. So they had two, no, sorry, three groups of kids. They were all the same age. They were all from the same random sample. And they put one group into like just this little, I wouldn't call it a forest, but well, I guess it was a forest, a little forest area where they could climb trees, you know, dig holes, build dams on a little creek and all sorts of stuff like that. They put another group on just a regular playground like you'd find behind a school. And another, ground, another group was just inside playing. And they, I think they did it for a year, maybe over a whole year, where they were only allowed to play in those locations. And then they looked at the results of that. It's pretty controlled. I, yeah. Okay. I'm a biology teacher and I gotta tell you something. And, and I'm a gardener. And I'm on new I, I I receive newsletters, I visit websites, I've never seen anything as, as good and useful as this. Thank you. This is really wonderful. <coughs> and that's kind of my first question is I'm I'm hoping that you're planning to kinda planning to kind of maintain and keep up with yes. this. Yep. What does that look like? What, what's your next focus? How are you thinking about time management? I don't know. Are you going to grow a staff? Can I come work for you? Sure. Uh, what are your plans? <laughs> well, right now, a lot of it's still under construction. I don't know if on the activities page, I didn't, probably didn't scroll down, but half of them are still on the under construction section. So I'm still working on actually building those things and putting them up on the site. And as I come up with new ideas, I definitely want to put them up there. And hopefully, people will send in their own ideas, and I can put that up there. And I didn't show you this, but there's also a, a blog. Come on. If I can interrupt. So this yeah. is exactly what I'm pushing at. So I understand there are big, there are big plans, and you've done a lot already. Uh, how, how will you scale it in a way that it will be manageable? How do you plan to manage it? How do I plan to manage it? I have no idea. I don't, I don't know yet. Like, I don't know where it's going to go. Because yeah. if people don't start actually going to it, yeah. if people aren't aware of it, then what's the point of, yeah. of managing it, yeah. <laughs> right? So first, I think the first goal is to actually get people to be aware of it, to go there, to look at it, and to give their own feedback. And then once that happens, then we can really grow into something. Because I think without the support of other people, there's but first of all, I can't do it by myself. I can't grow. And second of all, there wouldn't be any point of growing because no one would be watching. So I think the first thing before we even get to growing into something bigger or getting a staff or something like that is to really get it out there in the first place. Yeah. So, that's yeah. so do you have some plans for how to do that? Yeah, actually, during the informal presentation, Mr. Stark recommended that I go to some elementary schools and give a similar presentation showing them all these cool stuff like the poison ivy on Washington Street and all the cool crafts and activities. And also, you guys can help out. Tell your students. Tell everyone you know. Send it to everyone. Like, you're all teachers. You have access to hundreds of kids. Like, get it out. <laughs> but are you doing anything on Facebook? Yeah, there is a Facebook page. Oh, well, I can't access it from here because it's blocked, which is a good thing, by the way. I think that's good. Um, Can I ask questions about your survey research for a moment? Yeah, sure. You mentioned, so who were the 500 participants? Where did you, um, did you actually survey? A lot of them were teenagers. I put it up on Facebook and told everyone to send it out to their friends. Yeah. And I also gave it to a bunch of adults I know and told them all to send it out to their colleagues and friends and so on. So the majority of the people were still teenagers, but there were a significant amount. I think 30% of them were over 30. So it was a little skewed, but. Were, were, there, were there, in your research so far, your survey research so far, was there information that you got or data that you got that seemed to either contradict or correlate most closely? Um, I, and I'm mostly interested in the contradictions with other people's research or stuff that you had read in that, in that Bible that you attached to? There weren't many contradictions. I think the amount of time people spent using electronics was a little less than expected, actually. Were there any surprises for you? Surprises, yes. The, the one I showed earlier were for adults, when they're talking about their childhood, 
they were significantly less stressed, significantly more physically active. And then you look at the, the results for the kids, they're significantly more stretch, stressed. And I don't have the graph for the fitness yet, and I'm sorry, but it, it is what you'd expect. It's significantly less physical, physically active. And let's see, there was another one. Um, yeah, a lot of people said that they don't want to be more connected with nature. That was kind of interesting. I was expecting. Said that they don't want to be more connected with nature. They just don't care. And even on this one on the bottom, hold on, where is it? A lot of people said that they just don't want to. It's too dirty. And a lot of the other ones were just, it's boring. It's lame. I don't want to go outside. So. That was kind of surprising on my was part. But between the adults and the teenagers in those categories? Not really. Those were pretty much the same. Any more questions? Did you enjoy this? I did. See the obstacles you hit and maybe any changes you noticed in yourself as a result of this experience? Yes. Biggest obstacle, probably time management. And Mr. Kenosi warned us about this, that we would totally waste our first week. And I said, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not like that. But no, I totally wasted the first week. Because when you have a month and a half in front of you, you're like, wow, that's a really long time. I don't need to do anything this week. And you do. And so managing my time where I sort of do all the fun stuff, like making crafts, as well as actually putting it up and doing the research. That was kind of difficult. Another obstacle was when I put, first put the site up. I put it up right before the informal presentation. And I don't know if you remember, but the whole formatting was screwed up. And I got kind of freaked out about that. But it's fixed now, so it's good. Yeah. Any other personal? Oh, personal changes, right. Um, personal learnings. I learned to be a lot more independent. It was really great not to have someone holding my hand the whole way saying, OK, you need to have 10 flash, like note cards in by Friday, and they need to be this format. Like It was really great to finally be able to do my own thing and figure out how I work best. And that was really useful. I think it'll be hopefully useful in college next year. And yeah, I learned how to make a website. Didn't know how to do that before. require an outline, none of them require a first draft, none of them for a second draft or even a rough draft. The, uh, they basically give you a month or even two months to write a 10 page paper and if you don't hand it in on the first day, you get an F. Uh, and it's up to you whether or not you want to make a first draft or a second draft or even not to do it at all. So actually learning how to do this, how to budget your time wisely is excellent for college. All right. All right, thank you, Zia. All right, cool. Juniors. <laughs>